Well, welcome everybody. Uh, thank you all for joining us for another Indisposable Live. My name is Matt Prindeville and I'm the CEO and Chief Solutioneer at Upstream. Uh, for those of you who don't know us, we help business, government, and nonprofit leaders ideate, accelerate, and scale the new reuse economy and circular packaging systems. I am very excited to have my friends and colleagues, Amy Larkin and Claudette Yuska from Resolve PR3 and Olga Kachuk from Green Blue and the Sustainable Packaging Coalition on the show today. Amy's an award-winning entrepreneur. She's an activist and author, and she's been at the forefront, forefront of the environmental movement uh, for decades. And she's the co-founder and director of PR3, which is a public-private partnership to reuse, refill, replace single-use packaging. PR3 aims to create a system that's gonna de-risk, integrate, and scale reuse. Next, we have Amy's partner in crime, Claudette Yuska, who is the co-founder and technical director at PR3. Claudette is a trained engineer and researcher with 20 years of experience uh, in the environmental movement. And last but not least, we have Olga Kachuk. She is the director of bioeconomy and reuse initiatives at Green Blue, where she explores how reusable packaging systems, as well as food waste prevention, bio-based packaging, and composting can lead to a more sustainable use of resources. So today we're gonna to talk about creating standards and design guidelines around reuse and why they're needed to scale reusable packaging, foodware, and infrastructure. Reuse systems for bottled beverages uh, have proliferated around the world, but outside of that, most reuse services are disconnected and small scale. And many of the corporate pilots are just that, little private ventures with few connections to other initiatives and few plans to scale. At Upstream, we know that scaling reuse is gonna require the utilization and modification of existing infrastructure, as well as the development and deployment of new infrastructure. And our friends at PR3 and at Green Blue, they've dug in hard on these infrastructure and design questions. And I am very excited for you all and for me uh, to learn more about what they've discovered. So welcome to the Indisposable Live uh, show here, Amy, Claudette, and Olga. Thanks, Matt. Thanks for having us. So just a quick uh, housekeeping note, we're gonna go about 30 to 35 minutes as a group, and then we're gonna pivot to your questions. And as we go along, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen uh, to ask questions that come to you, and we'll try to get to as many of them as possible. And finally, after the hour is up, uh, don't forget to head on over to the speed networking section right after this to connect with some of the panelists and members of the audience uh, who are with us today. And my team's going to drop the Zoom link in the chat shortly. Uh, so without further ado, I just want to dive right in. And, and Amy, uh, I'd like to start with you. You know, at Upstream, part of what we like to focus on is vision painting for how the future could look like, uh, not just how it is today. And given your deep expertise in reuse systems, I'm wondering if you'd be willing to paint a picture for our audience for what the world could look like in 10 years. I would love to, Matt. Uh, hello, everyone. So here is my phone. And I use this phone and I fly too many places, actually. I get off the plane, I'm in Bulgaria or wherever I am, and the phone works. And the reason that works with a new service provider is standards. And of course, I'm taking with me my little USB thumb drive. Same thing. Why does this work on everything we own? Because it has standards. We believe that by creating strong standards to undergird the new reuse system, we can go to the store, get a coffee at our cool cafe or McDonald's, take the coffee, go to the park, put it in a bin, and then it will get picked up, washed, redistributed, all in a shared infrastructure system. Same thing, if I go to the store, I get olive oil or shampoo, I pick it up, I use it to the last drop, and I then put it eventually at my home, in my office, at the transit center, wherever, uh, Claudette will share with you how the standards will make this happen, but this is the infrastructure that will allow us to save minimum 50% of our GHG, our, our greenhouse gas emissions, and perhaps 90% of the plastic production in the world 
to move away from single use packaging to reusable packaging. And this is what standards enable us to do and de-risk the transformation from start to finish. So that's what I wanna do, Matt. Amazing, amazing. I love it. I share, I share your vision, Amy, I love it. Claudette, you wanna build on that? I know you and Amy are, are partners in crime here. You wanna you want to build on what Amy has shared with us? She's the criminal. She's the uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I will just add that, you know, to, to, to put a little bit more description of that, I imagine a place where there's, we sometimes talk of a fourth bin, you have recycling, you have waste, you have compost, and then you will have a reuse bin that is easy to use. The standards help you identify this is a, a container that goes in this bin, it's clear, unlike in recycling today. And I imagine a vision where you almost can leapfrog over recycling for where consumers don't have to be engaged in recycling anymore because all of our packaging is reusable and it can be up to industry to then take the used packaging to decide when they want to sell it to the recyclers. And so that's my vision. And I think, you know, the standards are going to help us get there. Amazing. Amazing. Olga, what about you? What's, what's your vision for the future in 10 years? Well, I think it fits nicely with what we've heard from Amy and Claudette in the sense that right now, and you know, you mentioned this, Matt, right now we have uh, pilots, right? And they seem very haphazard in terms of what's available to consumers and why, like why, why is it shampoo and deodorant from a few different brands that are available in refillables? And why is it, um, you know, certain types of food products that are available in dispensers and uh, it's very um, bizarre right now what we have. And so I think the vision is to move towards having some kind of standardization around the categories that reuse makes the most sense for and having brands align and work together to uh, provide that infrastructure and the design, you know, the shared container design or the shared dispenser design so that it's less about um, you know, having to make this big commitment to, to, to try a certain brand and then stay with them for life if you want to reuse a container and more about the fact that, you know, you can still experiment, you can still try and you can have a sense as a consumer that there's uh, a number of different options. It's not just food service that's in reuse. Uh, you know, there's going to be personal care products, home care products that are in reusable packaging and that it, it, it is sort of across stores, across platforms it all starts to look uh, similar and look alike. And it's not, you know, one-off examples where everyone has different rules and different approaches to how they have pursued reuse. I love it. I love it. I'm hearing, hearing some themes here. So some universality in the, in the collection infrastructure and ability for multiple companies to utilize the same types of, of, of collection infrastructure. You know, I think getting into barriers, which is my next question. I mean, it sounds like one of the big barriers is that the infrastructure doesn't exist today, or if it does, it's very small scale and, and disaggregated. You know, what are, what are some of the, the barriers to, to this vision taking off? And um, Olga, I'll start with you on this one. I think right now we are many companies from so what we've observed we you know we we run the sustainable packaging coalition at green blue and we have member companies um, that are experimenting with reuse and we've also been tracking the reuse space for quite some time and I think what we're seeing right now is that there's um uh really you know throwing darts to and seeing what what sticks and what lands in the middle and there isn't much of a strategy or an approach um and so the it's it creates uh, over and over again we hear that you know well consumers aren't ready it's a lot of behavior change and i think it's a little bit of a chicken and egg problem like of course consumers aren't ready if there's no cohesion in what we're seeing and offering to consumers um of course you know it's confusing and unlikely that behaviors will stick if every program is different and every you know you there's a lot of brand loyalty involved so um i think there's going to need to be more clarity around where reuse makes the most sense. So we talk a lot about fit for reuse and, and particularly around like, is it, are you pursuing returnable packaging, refillable packaging at home on the go, all of those different, you know, options and frameworks. We're at that point where companies, I think, need to take a step back and figure out, okay, what's our strategy here? Not just reuse for the sake of reuse or because our competitor is doing it, but how should we do it? What makes the most sense for our product? 
And what's our plan for maybe we'll, you know, we can talk about this later, but what's our plan for eventually getting to reuse as the default rather than reuse as this pilot offering over here with single use sitting right next to it on the shelf? Um, so we're, we're at that point where companies are still trying to figure out, you know, when it makes the most sense and what, how they should be approaching it um, rather than kind of jumping on the bandwagon. I love that. Reuse is the default. What do we need to do to get there? Uh, what do we need to do to get there, Claudette? What are the, bar what are the barriers to, to that happening? Uh, well, these days I see one of the barriers, unfortunately, I see is that there's a lot of investment in emerging policies going into place that are prioritizing recycling, which I think we all know is sort of a downstream solution. It's still a single use system when you recycle because the material needs to be picked up and remanufactured. And so I almost see that as a barrier because as you know, as investment money, government money focuses on recycling, that's money that is not going to reuse. And I think reuse should be the priority. And we need to push for reuse to be something that is the first choice that it becomes the default. And then recycling is a sort of a secondary for after products are still reused. And so I almost see that as a barrier these days that the more people are pushing towards recycling, it gets in the way of this vision of reuse. It locks us into a single use system, I'm afraid. I, I'm so glad you brought that up because I think that, you know, as these conversations around extended producer responsibility for packaging and getting new bottle bills or deposit return systems out there in the United States have emerged. Again, my my finding is that so many of these conversations are still stuck in recycling. And yes, it's important that we have brands have some skin in the game and help to optimize the current systems around recycling. You know, what we also need them to be investing in these new reuse systems. And to to us, like EPR and deposit return systems are, they can be tools or they should be tools to help create a circular economy for packaging that prioritizes the waste reduction hierarchy, mm -hmm. reduce and reuse first um, before recycling. So, you know, I know Amy, we share that, we share that perspective and vision. I mean, again, what are what building on what what uh, Olga and Claudette have said, I mean, what are you seeing as some of the barriers to this happening? Well, I think there's one real barrier that we are going to have to deal with, and that is for consumer goods, there are not packing plants close by. They're they're very often centralized as opposed to decentralized. And that will be a real issue of both financial and logistical issues. But, but I think the bigger issue is that large companies who basically tell the story and create the landscape of our consumer economy are not really ready to invest the time. It's not the money, it's the time. And two examples, and I am i usually don't talk like this in public, but here you go. <laughs> we were on a call with the head of circular economy for a very big consumer goods company a few years ago and talking about working with us to help create a new system. And we were asked by these, I don't know, four vice presidents or whoever was on the call, what will, how much time do you think it will take? And we said to probably two people, three hours a week each, one in operations, one in sustainability. And the answer was, well, we don't have that kind of time. Well, then don't say you're going to change your model because that's the time it's going to take. Similarly, and as we know, everyone who works in these companies works 60 hours a week. I'm not, you know, I'm not throwing stones at how hard they're working, but the prioritization on the, of the need for this new system, don't say we need it and then not do it. And that's what's happened. Love Secondly, it. another example, we were, I won't, we were on a call with a group of CEOs that work on climate. That's as much as I'm going to say about it. And, and they said, how much money do we need to invest so we can announce something at the COP on how many GHGs we'll invest, we, we, we will save 
by doing reuse. And we said, well, actually there's no system. The point is we need your time. We need an entrepreneur in the CEO's office for every one of your companies. And within a year, we will have designed a system with standards, with colleagues, with city, you know, let's make the blueprint together. Oh, no, no, no. How much money so we can state that we're going to say, we could have, I'm telling you, we could have gotten a lot of money invested so they can make an announcement and zero time committed. And it is complicated. It takes time. It is a new system. It is a system that actually looks at the disposal end of the cycle. Yep. That's what circularity means. And there are a lot of companies that talk about it, but will not actually make the investment. It is financial, part of it's financial, but the bigger piece of it is, it's in some ways what Olga's talking about. Okay, where do we start? What's gonna work? We have yep. a lot of those answers and yep. we are ready, ready to deploy. And Prioritiza I prioritization. I mean, I, what I heard you say is that, you know, how do we get these companies to prioritize, prioritize these, these new systems, new ways of doing things, new ways of thinking? This is a great segue in, in the, you know, why, why do we need standards and design guidelines? I think that's a, that's a, that's the question that, that I've got. And Amy, I know you've been deep diving into this. Um, why do we need uh, design standards and guidelines? I think I'm going to pass it to Claudette because she's the person who's been writing those standards. Love it. So what the picture we often paint is of all these um, companies is companies are making these announcements about their pilots. You have all different brand owners having their own collection systems. And, you know, you're it's never going to be the case where you're where a consumer will say, OK, well, this coffee cup has to go to this place. Let me remember to stop there on my way home. And this clamshell from McDonald's or wherever needs to go back to McDonald's, it's completely inconvenient, right? And not only is it inconvenient and will never scale, but it's inefficient. And so it, it, it will not serve, you know, it will not create the environmental benefits that we're looking for if everyone does it independently. So with standards is when you can start sharing infrastructure. If you don't have some sort of standardization, you can't all share the same infrastructure. But once you do standardize to the extent that you can share the collection points and you can share some transport, suddenly you can have a system that is convenient, it's affordable, and that cities would like because they only have to put one bin on the street corner and not have to deal with all these different collection systems or all the different trucks that it would take to collect everything. And so that's sort of one reason, right? Just the efficiency and the convenience yeah. of it. But there's a lot more reasons too if you dig in you know, there are trade barriers. If everyone does this individually, anything that goes over, over the border, th this is going to be a problem. Um, it's going to interfere with trade. And so once you start digging in, you see that there are other reasons why standards are important as well. Um, but clearly, you can't have an interoperable system unless we all agree to the same set of parameters for how the system is going to be designed. And, and, and I would just say, if there are standards, I will not have to carry the clamshell with my peanut sauce from the Thai restaurant to go into, I'm not going to put that in my purse. It's never going in my purse. <laughs> and therefore, it's, ne you know, if I have to return it, something that is not in a ubiquitous place that yeah. is standardized, it's Love not going it. to get reused. Convenient, convenience, uh, I'm hearing, you know, this is how we're going to enable uh, scale. This is how we're going to get businesses engaged and, and working on this. And, and so just for everybody, please don't forget to check out uh, PR3's reusable packaging standards. Uh, I'll make sure that somebody from our team puts the link in the chat for you. And you also have to check out uh, the Sustainable Packaging Coalition's report, which Olga was the principal author uh, around reusable uh, design guidelines. So Olga, why, why do we need design guidelines for reuse? Uh, so, I mean, so many reasons, Matt, <laughs> where I think a lot of for, there are some companies that I think are, are ready for this, <clears throat> the standards that Claudette and Amy have put out. And then I think there are some companies that are blindfolded right now when it comes to reuse. And we need to start with square one of, okay, let's go back to the basics of what, what, if, what even is this? What is the definition of reuse? What, how is that different than refill? How is that different than return? How 
what can you say is the is the jam jars the glass jam jars or the yogurt jars that you're selling that consumers occasionally like to keep around the house and like store their paper clips in <laughs> is that reuse you'd be surprised but there are brands calling that reuse and so we're still at that point in some in some ways of okay no 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 that's that's not what we mean here <laughs> you you made a nice pretty jar and someone can you know store some stuff in it or like have it as a planter outside that's not what we're talking about so guidelines the guidelines that we published take 15 steps back to look at the definition of reuse, to talk about what are we trying to accomplish with reuse? The fact that if we're, that the primary goal is to reduce the environmental footprint, the primary goal, so that having that in your, you know, stated uh, sort of front and center, this is the purpose is really important because it tends to get lost in the shuffle of, you know, um, various like marketing initiatives and trying to keep up with your competitors. And um, we just felt like there was so much, so much groundwork that needed to be laid for reuse to be successful. Like, what is it? How, how, what is the goal? What's the purpose? What are we trying to accomplish? And then there's a whole section in, in our guidelines that are um, sort of what we internally call myth busting because there are so many myths that or misconceptions i think about the purpose or what you can reasonably expect reuse to accomplish um, there's a lot of focus on material swaps like well we'll just switch from plastic to stainless steel and call that reuse and we will have improved the overall product package system and it's not that simple so we take a step back we like bust some of those myths really go into what can reuse reasonably accomplish and what is it what is it too much to ask for you know it's not going to it's not going to um nest if you continue to sell single use uh, alongside reuse you're not going to solve the ocean plastic pollution problem so it's not a replacement it's you know you can't say that you've solved um ocean plastic pollution if you're still um putting out single use right and and it's it's a lot more complicated than that so our guidelines are really trying to cover a lot of a lot of ground but um some of those very basics around what is it, what are we trying to accomplish, what can you um, say, uh, you know, your your goal is with reuse, and then the second half is more around, okay, you're on the right path now, let's talk about fit for reuse, standardization versus customization, and the importance of getting actual return rates up, return in practice as opposed to in theory, um, which is hugely important for that environmental footprint piece of, of reuse. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I think, you know, we've, we've, there's been a lot of pilots, a lot of experimentation, and now we need to be driving towards scale. And that also means like exactly what you're saying, Olga, making sure that that we're getting, you know, optimal uses out, out of the, the reusable uh, package or the reusable foodware uh, so that we're not creating more problems <laughs> than we would be by using the single use product, right? Claudette, you've literally been writing these standards. So, you know, peel back the curtain a little bit and give our audience a sense of, you know, what are the most important standards and guidelines uh, as you see them? Sure. I, you know, let me start by saying we've written standards with um, much input. You know, I didn't write them alone. There was enormous input from a range of stakeholders, big um, consumer goods companies, reuse service providers, governments. Uh, and so it was a group effort for sure. But I want to say to start with that the standards don't describe um, packaging. So it doesn't, the standards don't say, your bottle has to be this shape and this size and has to have this branding on it. It leaves it up to companies that give, keeps, it lets brand owners um, control a lot of, a lot of the design still. We're not designing containers for, for companies, but what we are doing is setting parameters for if you want your container to be part of a shared system, there are certain um, labeling requirements. There's certain barcodes or QR code requirements so that a logistics provider, when they pick it up, understands who owns it and what needs to happen to it. So we set parameters, but we certainly don't design packaging for companies. They'll still have the autonomy to do that themselves. And if I could, you know, and so, and I think I've touched on just now two of one of the most important standards. There's a digital, there's seven components to our standards so far, and this will probably expand and the, the standards will continue to evolve over the years. But uh, one of the main components that's gonna be enormously important is a digital standard which um, really 
says, okay, if you have a barcode or a QR code on, on, on your packaging, there has to be certain elements that tell the logistics company who owns it and what needs to happen to it. And that's not currently incorporated into barcodes. And we're working with GS1, which is the global organization that standardizes barcodes to enable this to happen across the board. Um, so that's a really important standard that's gonna make the whole system work. There's also a component that's called labeling. And I encourage everyone to look at that standard because um, you know, part of the way to make this work is to have consumers use the system properly. And so we think it's enormously important to have one standardized logo for reuse so that when a consumer sees a bottle and they see that logo, they say, oh, that's reusable. I have to make sure it doesn't go in the garbage or it doesn't go in the recycling bin. It has to go in a reuse bin that has the same logo on it. And we've put a lot of design work into a concept for a global logo that we're really proud of. We had a, a really wonderful marketing agency, Masa and Bose, help us with that. It's done a lot of focus grouping. I encourage everyone to take a look um, because it's a really hopeful symbol um, that we hope um, the companies will, will begin using. And it's not to say you have to take off your branding. It's to say, in addition to your branding, kind of like an organic logo, <laughs> you would have this logo on it to alert consumers that it's reusable. Very cool. Very cool. Olga, what about you? I mean, you just put out this, this fantastic report. Everybody should read this report as well as the PR3 uh, design guidelines. You know, what, uh, what are you seeing as far as the types of, of, of standards and guidelines that you think are most important to drive change towards this vision? I think at this point, we, we need companies to do more self-education around what the, some of the, what I was mentioning around the goals and the and the definition of, of reuse to really make sure that they understand what it is that they're trying to create here. And then to think of, to, we have a section in our, our guidance around um, standardization versus customization. And I think it, it would be fantastic if more companies thought long and hard about how far are we going to get if we create our own option here, our own design, our own, you know, refillable lipstick pod with its own um, insert versus partnering with some of our peers and competitors. Uh, so so we're in it at an interesting point where I, I, perhaps I'd like to see more and more companies start to work together. I, certainly, I, I think I saw in some of the chat, um, certainly it's easier, I think, around uh, food service than in CPG, um, but CPG could perhaps learn from food service in the sense that like we're, you know, we have a, a standard coffee cup format, right? No one is proposing that we have like a square coffee cup or that we drink out of bowls, right? So maybe we could do more of that for some of these other applications and that we will get farther if, if companies pool resources and, and use these standards that, that we've been hearing about to um, sort of have the one, you know, the one shampoo, or the, the one refillable shampoo system, the one refillable, um, you know, cleaning product system um, that can have the interoperability and allows consumers to um, experiment with different brands and still be part of the reuse system. So, yeah. you know, more of that, taking a step back and thinking, maybe we could go farther if we, if we worked less on the customization in our own splashy design and launch product launch and more around an industry standard for something like shampoo. I love that. You know, I, I, if you look at kind of the, the beverage systems that are at scale around the world, you look at beer in Europe, for example, they're just sharing bottles, right? Like, you know, it's, 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 you know, that the bottle was in, you had your beer in it yesterday. It's got my beer in it today and it's going to have somebody else's beer in it tomorrow. And I, and I, I think there's something that's really elegant um, about that. It's the way nature works, uh, for example. And uh, uh, so, you know, thinking about opportunities, and I, I think this is probably one of the last questions I'll have for you guys before we move into the Q&A. So for those of you that have been wait on the fence for your question, throw it in that chat now, because we're going to start getting to them in just about five minutes here. But Amy, you know, where are you seeing the big opportunities uh, to move reuse forward at this point? How much time you have, Matt? Matt? No, I we, think... got, we got 29 minutes. Okay. <laughs> I think that, um, first of all, in the age of climate, and the age of COVID and the age of global instability, localizing supply chains is essential. Amen. Reuse is D 
the opportunity to keep commerce going, functional, more secure. So it serves and solves what, you know, many of the grave issues of the day. So that's one. I haven't even talked about environmental issues. Environmentally, it is a solution that is commensurate with the gravity of both the plastic and the climate crises. Plastic is, as we know, oil. As we also know, we have to use less fossil fuels. The amount of greenhouse gas emissions used for reuse is between 50 and 80% less than it is for recycled and single use products. So there are very few solutions that are commensurate with the gravity of our problems, very few. This is one of them. So that's the second yeah. big opportunity. The third big opportunity is that for infrastructure investments around the world, and let's just start with our country in the US, as we all know, there's a lot of infrastructure investment on the table, a lot of it for climate, a lot of it for waste. This is like early solar. When solar began, there were government investments around the world and the pioneer companies and the pioneer adapters and the pioneer startups were charging, oh, something like 70 cents a kilowatt hour. And now it's four cents a kilowatt hour. That's the road we're on. That's the opportunity we have. It will become an industry that will solve global and local problems. It is also inclusive. It is for poor people, rich people. Claudette has been designing these standards so that it works for people who do not have bank accounts or credit cards. It is, it is an, the opportunities are extraordinary and we're just crazy if we don't grab it. Amen. Yeah, man, getting fired up here, guys. Appreciate it. Love it, Amy. Uh, so Claudette, you want to build on that? I mean, I, I think where are you seeing the, the opportunities to, to move reuse forward? Yeah, I don't know that I have anything to add on what Amy said, exactly what she said. Like this is the low hanging fruit in terms of localizing our supply chains in a way that um, reduces pollution and, and, and does a lot of great things. And we are building the standards in a way that, you know, that that everyone can access this. So part of the reason that we're building these standards is that we don't want these systems that work for people with credit cards and smartphones and extra money to spend on this. We're trying to build the standards so that the systems are accessible to everybody with very low deposits, if any deposit on these containers. And you don't have to have a fancy phone. You don't have to have a credit card. We're really using the standards as an opportunity to increase access to the system. And I think, um, you know, in the process, curtail plastic production, you know, what a great, what a great combination of benefits. All right, Olga, what, what about you? What are the opportunities to scale reuse at this point? From your perspective? I think the, the opportunity is, is something that I touched, there, there's so many opportunities. That's the exciting piece here. Uh, there's an opportunity to shift the thinking and to think about reuse as the default. So how could you, as a brand, instead of having it be a thing over here or an option, and then you're mm -hmm. struggling to get consumers to participate and there's confusion between the two options, how could you, even if it's just for one thing, how could you make it so that reuse is the default? So there was a, um, before the pandemic, there was a, a very exciting um, headline that caught my eye about how Blue Bottle was committing to, um, uh, to offering, to basically only having reusable cups in their cafes. I think this may have been a kind of a California only commitment, um, but that was really exciting because that's, that's what I mean by reuse as the default. There's no, you know, do I do this? How do I do this? Do I have to opt in? It's just what's offered. It's like when you go to a sit down restaurant, no one is asking you if you'd actually like to eat off of foil. You're just, <laughs> you're just sitting at a table eating off a plate. So the more that we could see that um, 
across uh, across categories in in retail to have an example you know perhaps a specific category a specific section of the store where reuse is the norm and reuse is the default that would be enormously exciting and i and i think the other opportunity here is i think we need to give consumers a chance there's so much discussion of like consumers aren't ready they're confused they're not going to participate and i'm not sure i don't i don't know i think especially if we design it correctly and 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 smartly the interest is there and i think consumers are interested in participating and in some of that behavior change because it's not just about the environmental benefits there's other benefits too it's exciting it's interesting it's more convenient it tastes better it looks cooler yeah. so yep you know that consumers are ready i think i think so too yeah, and I, and I think you know consumers haven't they haven't been given an optimal system, right? Like I, I was at Circularity a few months back in, in Atlanta, and one of the um, keynotes was Sue Shelton. They do a lot of uh, consumer research, mm -hmm. and and they, she basically said to the entire audience of, of corporate sustainability officers that look the way things are today your predecessors created the way things are today. The consumers are working off of what your predecessors created. You can create the systems of tomorrow. And that was her exhortation. And it was very, very powerful. And so, you know, I'm excited to dive into the audience questions. Are you guys ready? We got some great, we got some great questions in here. Um, so one of the ones that that immediately caught my eye is from is from Jaina Lee. She says, "Hi, local Canadian government tuning in. Uh, welcome, Canadians. We'd love to have you guys here. I am wondering what a municipality's role is in scaling reuse or designing a reuse system. And Amy and Claudette, since you guys are literally intimately involved in this reuse Seattle project, I wondered if you wanted to jump in and answer that. It's huge. The, um, we are building a demonstration project in Seattle. We're calling it Reuse Seattle. You can find it online, reuseseattle.org. And um, the city of Seattle is leading with a combination of working with the people, uh, back up a second. The city of Seattle is deep green government, deep green city that has, was the leader in both recycling and then composting and decided that in fact, they have to move to reuse in order to be the greenest they can be and to serve their customers better and the environment and their pocket, their pocketbooks better. They have led the work with local companies, venues, reuse service providers providing the soft tissue work that is needed to understand how you can make a new system work. What they did when they moved people to compost was the same sort of thing. You, you cannot ask people to make this kind of move without the city working in, you know, I call one of the guys there, he's our whisperer. You know, and you need a whisperer to do something new like that. And the standards that we have developed are undergirding everything that the city is doing. And we are doing something similar in Jakarta and where the city there is also very involved as is actually the government of Indonesia. And we are also working with several cities with our European partners in the EU. But the city's role is to basically shepherd the new system in. So the city, part of why there is interest in creating shared infrastructure is there's gonna be one reuse bin on the streets of Seattle. And I don't want my product or my company to not be there. Got it. So I'm going to I'm going to bounce around too. I'm going to ask specific questions to Amy, Olga and Claudette. And if you guys want to pile on, just feel free to pile on at the end of it. But I'd love to try to get to as many questions as possible here. So there's a, a good question here from Elena Bertacci that says, can't good recycling systems be important collection infrastructure for reuse in the future? And I love this question because I've, I've been thinking about the same thing. You know, we've got our, our local uh, 
uh, MRF um, a recycling facility here uh, in Maine that does bottle deposit collection, and they're starting to take refillable glass dairy bottles. I've often thought that existing recycling infrastructure could be modified. Olga, what do you, what do you think about the, the this uh, this question? Yeah, I think beverage is a good example of that, um, where, you know, we, we're already doing some collection and, you know, there's examples, I think I saw someone was referring to the example in Oregon, where they have, um, you know, beverage deposit, there's, there's, it's a close relationship, essentially, because you have the deposit bill in the state where you are improving the recycling rates of, of all beverage containers, um, because of that bill, but then there's also a specific program for beer and cider and some others where it's not getting recycled, it's getting reused, it's getting refilled with, you know, it's going back to the breweries in the area that are participating. So there's definitely more of that we could do where we're, we're if we improve the collection system for something, you know, like, like beverages, we're improving the collection system. Now we don't have to recycle that glass, we can refill it. So if we have our work cut out for us in terms of, you know, beverage is, is a good place to start and um, difficult enough, but I think we could perhaps learn from that and see if there are other examples um, that, that make sense. Uh, I think that one is a particularly good example because of, of glass and the fact that, you know, it can be durable. Um, if you're collecting plastics, for instance, it's it's a little bit more of, uh, you know, the plastic typically isn't durable. Um, so you could collect it as a feedstock for reusable uh, plastic packaging, but there's more work involved. Can I add, Matt, that um, when Amy and I started this project, we reached out first. One of the first companies we reached out to is, you know, companies like Waste Management and Suez in Europe saying, this can be your new business model. If you're going house to house collecting Absolutely. anyway, recycling, yeah. you can also collect reuse. And also you can um, make space in your aging MRFs as you update them, upgrade them. You can make space for reuse to be part of your business model as well. And, um, and as it turns out, you have a lot of, instead of those big companies doing it, you have a lot of entrepreneurs like Muse, Dream Zero up in Toronto that are doing it themselves and are merging to say, well, we'll take on that role. And so I think it'll be a question now, who's going to, you know, who is going to take on that role? We don't know if it's going to be the big companies or the entrepreneurs, but in any case, clearly, and this is related, if your if companies are already collecting recycling, this, there's a op huge opportunity for them to expand and do this as well. And there's just one other piece of this, which is not about recycling, but about retail warehouses. Most people or many people know 15% of what's bought online is returned to warehouses that are total loss leaders. There are, there are trucks going to and from, they're not, they're not compaction trucks. This is potential high value places for reuse infrastructure from washing facilities to packing facilities. The real estate's there, it is decentralized. And right now it is just a loss leader. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I've been thinking about this because we've we've partnered with some or we've connected and been working with some reuse companies that are, you know, their model is they're they're trying to create an alternate to Amazon, right? So they're they've got a warehouse, they've got pr products, consumable products they want to sell and reusable, refillable containers, and they're working on that logistics infrastructure to get it out there and get it washed and, and restocked. You know, so this is a good segue into the solutions provider questions. This is an anonymous uh, attendee. So they say solutions providers are in a scramble or reuse service providers are in a scramble to provide uh, for brands. Are you engaging them in this? Uh, they are the ones who make it happen and they just have to sell their ideas uh, to brands. So Amy, maybe we'll start with you and Olga, see if you want to pile onto that. We work with reuse service providers every day very closely. Uh, when Claudette developed the standards, there were reuse service providers input constantly in Seattle. There are currently two reuse service providers building wash facilities now. Uh, we expect many others actually to join fairly soon. Um, I think that any reuse service provider that we haven't spoken to is welcome to contact us because uh, we, we are completely partnering with them and working with them to both make 
make sure that the standards serve them. I mean, these are the most important entrepreneurs in our world here. And if they're gonna work for large brands, we need the standards to work for them. Hopefully they will and they are. So, something important to add, I think this is an important piece to get in that um, our standards were developed in house with the help of stakeholders, but we are in a process now over the next month of launching um, a consensus body for each of our standards that'll then work through, um, the, the goal is to get the standards through ANSI, the American National Standards Institute, and then up through ISO, the International Standards Organization. And so we are performing consensus bodies for each component of our standard, and we will be soliciting um, volunteers to serve on those consensus bodies um, starting in September, uh, doing one standard at a time. And so that will be the opportunity we will certainly um, publicize through WEPS reuse portal, through Upstream, through with other platforms out there to ask for volunteers that want to be part of the committees that will continue to evolve and develop the standards. Like we're not, we don't plan to own these standards forever. They need to be standards that are jointly owned by you know all the stakeholders that are out there. And so please everyone look for the call to be part of these committees. And um, that includes governments as well. We need government, especially, you know, of all, we need a range of stakeholders, including people that work in government and in recycling to, um, to make sure that the standards work for all stakeholders involved. So there's an interesting question here from, uh, from Upstream Zone, Miriam Gordon, about uh, how state and federal agencies are, are targeting money for recycling and reuse infrastructure. And how can, and I, I would add that the, the EPR for packaging conversation is also really driving the investment conversation forward. How can we make sure that government investment in building localized reuse infrastructure is smart and what criteria are needed to ensure that state and federal uh, agency money is spent wisely. And Amy, I know you've been talking to a couple of, of agency folks and then- A couple, uh, yeah. Yeah, a couple. Yeah, what, what, do you got, what, what do they have to say about it? <laughs> I think that that's a brilliant question, Miriam. Uh, I think we certainly, and I'm sure you have put in, uh, our thoughts to the EPA, to the GSA piece, and we are very active with the alphabet soup of US government agencies on the Global Plastic Treaty. I think that to ensure that it's done right, uh, we would work with you to make sure that it's done. That's actually what we would do. I think we, we would collaborate. We appreciate, we appreciate that. <laughs> We're happy to help with Miriam and up, with Upstream and also American Sustainable Business Network. I, I think it's, um, I honestly don't even think there's a consensus amongst all the groups working. You know, I think it's a terribly difficult question you ask. It's essential and I don't have the answer. Maybe Olga or Claudette or Miriam, you, maybe you have the answer. Yeah, you know, there's another question here from Pat and Olga. I'll direct this one to you because it it, it 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 builds off of this question. It, it's do, you know, do you think this is from Pat Kaufman uh, from City of Seattle? Hi, Pat. Uh, this dialogue makes me want to ask: Do you think the free market will deliver? Do you see corporate America stepping up, or do you see a need for local legislation and policy to shift the reuse future so it relies less on consumer demand? I think it's, I think policy will certainly play a really important role because in a number of different places. So we, first and foremost around, I keep coming back to the definition, but you, you'd really be surprised by what people are trying to sneak in as reuse. So having, I've seen a few different state bills, uh, proposed EPR bills that have definitions of reuse. That's an important place to start. And there was a question about, um, uh, there was a question in the chat about making sure that reuse is, um, you know, safe to be reused, that there isn't um, chemicals of concern that are transferred uh, through dishwashing into food or into water supplies. That's one role where um, policies, there was actually, I think, a Washington state bill, if I remember correctly, that included this idea of making sure that reusable packaging is free of chemicals of concern in their proposed um, bill language. And that's huge. Like that's that, you know, as soon as you have that in a bill, that is, we can point to that and, and then tell industry, look, this is, this is all part of the same thing. It's not a side issue over here. This is how you need to be thinking about reuse. 
And then, so, so on the definitions piece and, and figuring out, okay, what are, we, what are we really counting as reuse? What do we mean when we say that? Um, and then certainly if there was an EPR system that incentivized and prioritized um, standardization and gave, um, you know, whether it was like eco-modulation points for, for brands to standardize across formats that would go a long way. There's some questions about, um, you know, incentives and like, what's the incentive for brands to do that? If there was, uh, if there were EPR, EPR incentives built into some of these laws, that would um, also, I think, go a long way. There's another, oh, go ahead, go ahead, Amy. Yep. I just wanna add one thing. Um, and I think it's going back a little bit to Miriam's question. Our experience with government agencies, especially in the federal government, that people who have been in many, many, many conversations on this don't really know what it is and what a system, what do you mean? Like they, they are not in a situation, we just were with a federal agency and who have been in many, many, I mean, leadership position. And we, they asked us 50 minutes of questions that were very specific. And at the end they said, oh, now we get it. And these are very smart people in the middle of the plastic conversation. And so how we do this, I think it's something all of us who work on this need to find better ways to share what it is complicated. I don't think we can pretend it's not. And so to get the best possible policy, the best possible infrastructure spending, first off, you have to have the understanding and it's certain somewhat like Olga's saying like step back. And yeah. it, it, is, it, it becomes clearer that most people are civilians on this even if they're smack in the middle of it. Yep, yep. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, trying to break down that complexity, one of the things that I, I talk about, this is tying into to a question from Bridget uh, Pulaski here, is that, you know, we're really trying to shrink these massive global supply chains for packaging materials and, and, pro and, and consumable products, right? A couch might be different, a TV might be different, but we're talking about, the products you buy day after day, week after week. I usually say it's the, it's it's the packaging that's in your garbage bin, in your recycling bin, and maybe even some of it in your composting bin. That's the stuff we're talking about. Um, and so this question is: How can we uh, can can you go further into talking about how reuse can localize supply chains, which is a big part of what we talk about in in the in the resilience, like you were talking about, Amy, and the benefits here. Um, Olga, do you want to you want to take a stab at that question? Well, one of the we, we've touched on this already, but one of the big uh, pieces of of the puzzle is the transportation and the fact that I think Amy talked about this that if you were to have localized systems, packaging would need to go so far to be washed or sanitized, and that in we've seen in a number of LCAs that's really key for driving down the impacts for allowing a brand to you know have a instead of having it a five hundred. Um, reuse reuse cycles that you need to achieve for it to be better than you know the status quo. It drives it down significantly. Um, so, thinking about how you can find local partners. I mean, we have some examples right now of reuse where we're we're shipping items across the country to wash and, and sanitize. Europe, to you. Or, yeah, and so this is not, I mean, that's not going to work. We're going to need local sanitation, sanitization and washing and logistics. And there's a lot and, of that already happening. And even more local, the local washing facilities are easier than the local packing. That's the big, that's the kicker. In other words, where's that shampoo? Where's that ice cream? Where's mm. that olive oil going to come from? It needs to be like in Seattle, that's an issue. Where is it going to be repacked? The wash facilities, I think, are easier. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So last question. So we, so uh, this is a question that said a lot of the conversation today has focused around uh, big corporations and what corporations need to do. What about small businesses? How can small businesses participate and contribute um, in this new reuse economy? 
and maybe Claudette, we haven't heard from you in a while. You want to, you want to start? I, I think small businesses, well, I can talk about Seattle in that, you know, there's, um, small businesses have the opportunity, especially in the food service industry, to partner with the reuse service providers to get, uh, you know, reusable cups, clamshells, things like that into them. I think that's one way. Um, Amy, what do you, I, I think that's the low hanging fruit, right? And that, and we see a lot, we're seeing in Seattle, we're seeing a lot of interest in that for sure. That's easy to get those small businesses involved. In terms of small retailers, this is something we're dealing with in Indonesia. It's certainly more complicated. It, it is more complicated and it's harder for those businesses. They have less space, they have less staff, they have no margin or starting something new when it's, it, 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 is, it is actively harder. So turn, turnkey solution. That, that's not the case for the yeah. small restaurant, cafe. Yep. And, you know, in Seattle, all the music venues from the small ones to the big ones, including, you know, small music clubs, as well as big, amp you know, big theaters. Yep. So, Olga, you get the last word. Well, I think there's an opportunity for smaller, smaller companies to lead the way in terms of accurate messaging and consumer education, because they are more likely to have the bandwidth to, to dig into this a little bit in terms of the aptitude, I guess, maybe, uh, rather than the bandwidth, and to be able to communicate to consumers, this is how it works, this is the benefit, and to you know not veer off into greenwashing territory. Um, so there's, you know, really, we, we're a desperately, we're at that point where we desperately need more messaging around, you know, the, what, what it is and why and what the value is. And I think that's where they can play an important role. They have the ear of consumers, of local consumers. They also have the opportunity, if you're a small cafe, you, you can easily make the decision to say, I'm doing all reuse, like you mm -hmm. were saying, Olga. Um, that that's when you come here, this is what you get. So they, I think it's easier for them to um, make that decision without having to go through a whole large company's uh, decision-making process. So they're a little bit more flexible, I think, which can be a benefit as well. Yeah, absolutely. Amazing. Well, I just want to close with a big thank you uh, to all of our, 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 our guests today. Thank you all for tuning in, especially on August. I was blown away that we got 200 folks that showed up today. Uh, thank you so much for tuning into the live stream. Couple of plugs. Uh, the second annual Reuse Awards, or you, some of you might know it as the Reusies, uh, is gonna be streaming online on September 29th. General admission is free. There are also VIP packages still available. Uh, you can also vote for the finalists for two more weeks until August 26th. So please go to the reusies.org to register for the event and to vote. Um, also a recording of uh, the event is gonna be shared with everybody after, Zoom, after the Zoom today. So if there's anybody from your team or your community that you wanna share this with, uh, that's gonna be available uh, in the next couple of days. And as always, uh, be sure to stay connected on news and upcoming events by visiting upstreamsolutions.org. You can sign up for our weekly uh, email newsletter. Uh, you can follow us on social. You should also receive a short survey in the chat. And after you leave this session, uh, please let us know what you think and feel free to share what topics you would like us to cover uh, in future live streams. Lastly, if you are interested or so inclined and you want to make some new friends and some new connections, we'd love for you to join our 30-minute speed networking right after this. It's going to take place on a separate Zoom line, uh, which we're dropping into the chat right now. Uh, and so we hope to see you there. Just you can click on, on that on uh, copy or paste and click on that separate Zoom line, and that should take you right over there. Thank you so much for being with us today, folks. We hope to see you at the networking and hope to see you at the next Indisposable Live.